Hello. Thank you for inviting me. It's my honor to be here, and I'm really sorry um, I'm speaking in English. But I've got some images with me, so I'm hoping um, that some of my ideas will be communicated. Is that okay? Ah, okay. Okay. So, yes. Um, so I will present um, some, of my, uh, some of my ideas um, on the magazine Pirsos, which uh, in Greek means torch. Um, well, in English, actually. Um, <laughs> so here are the covers of Pirsos from 1961 to 1968. It's actually the whole archive. Uh, Pirsos Illustrated Magazine launched its first issue in 1961, in January 1961. Um, was published in Dresden of the DDR uh, by political, Greek political refugees. The, mag the magazine was initiated uh, and monitored by the Enlightenment Committee of the Greek Communist Party, KUKUE. It was financed in its most part, because some of it came from the sales, uh, from the SED. In this paper, I will first present the magazine and its conditions of production, before I focus on the analysis of its visual language and briefly examine its editorial policy. And I will suggest that Pirsos constructed a Greek national imaginary drawing from the country's uh, landscape, its past, and its invented traditions. Further, Pirsos portrayed the achievements of socialism, uh, the difficulties of life in contemporaneous Greece, and finally, the lives and the achievements of the Greek political refugees. The magazine is the articulation of this past, the present coming together, structured as images. I argue that Pirsos' function uh, for its readership, mainly, was what, what uh, Walter Benjamin called a dialectical image. So as such, it invited them to experience the past by juxtaposing their lives, uh, in the traditions, the invented traditions, and the construction of um, the national past. Its aim, um, I argue, was to reinforce the refugees' collective national identity and to instill in them the desire for repatriation to contemporary Greece. Finally, a claim that Pirsos' visual language was the result of its specific conditions of production. I argue that uh, Pirsos would never look or be the same if it was produced anywhere else um, out of the socialist states where the refugees uh, resided. Um, so it was a very specific production in the DDR, uh, where the visual construction of the national was framed by international standards uh, of design and visual communication. So I'm kind of walking through that. That's the first issue of the magazine. Uh, as I said, January 1961. And I'm going to show you some images uh, to give you an idea of, um, I'm not going to stop or comment on these, but just to give you an idea of what was um, in some of the issues. So it's a poem by Costas Palamas, but I said. So Pirsos was a bi-monthly lifestyle magazine. In other words, a magazine that featured a broad range of subjects, uh, ranging from culture, history to politics, science and technology. It printed extracts from literature and poetry, travelogues, uh, reports to Greece, the socialist states, and the capitalist West. It showcased fashion and had cooking recipes, um, and regularly ran political cartoons. It included a full-color, eight-page supplement uh, dedicated, and I quote, the education and entertainment of children. Um, the magazine was illustrated throughout, with several pages printed in full-color, um, where it indicatively the f first issue of Pirsos is um, illustrated by 75%, with woodcuts, drawings. And overall, Pirsos production's values were of high standard even when compared to contemporary cheaper GDR periodicals. So the paper is glossy. I mean, I have got some issues with me if anyone would like to have um, a look afterwards. Uh, the paper is glossy, the cover, and, and it's a good quality um, for the paper shortages and everything. 
um, production. Um, not surprisingly, then Prisos was in deficit from its first years of uh, circulation and until the end. Um, Prisos also involved a wide network of actors in its production, uh, its institutional producers, the Kukue and the SAD, uh, its editorial board, uh, which was dispersed across the DDR. They lived in Weimar, Dresden, and Berlin. Uh, and it comprised of Nikos Akritidis, a member of the Central Committee of Kukue, whose ideological responsibility of the magazine was in addition to his full-time job. So he wasn't like full-time employed to work in Prisos, but he was, but he was pretty much very much involved uh, and full-time working for it. Um, as he was a uh, political representative in the DDR. Marika Sevastu Akritidou, which was a chief editor, that, that was her title, uh, a journalist who had previously worked uh, the Enlightenment Committee of Kukwe's uh, youth department, and was also married to Akritidis. Uh, Marika Minemi, one of the initial EVOP members of the Children's Aid Committee, uh, who worked in the Institute of the Greek Roman Studies at the Academy of Sciences uh, of the DDR, and she was credited as the director of PIRSOS. And finally, the artist Nikos Manousis, who was responsible for the art direction, uh, and of whom, unfortunately, I'm still looking to find out details. Um, so PIRSOS regular contributors included prominent members of the refugees' uh, intellectual communities, uh, author Dimitris Hadzis writes from the first issue, has a regular column uh, up until the end. Uh, Apostolos Pilios, Elia Alexiou, he hosted also um, occasional contributors, uh, Mel Poxioti has written, Rosa Imbriotti, um, etc. Uh, and of course it, also, um, it was also contributors from the refugees associations, um, many of them um, youth from the DDR, and I actually met somebody yesterday who um, wrote an article for Prisos. Um, and occasionally Prisos published reprints and translated articles, mainly from the Greek, Soviet, and East German press. Um, I'm gonna throw you a not very beautiful but statistic map just to give you an idea of what this is before I kind of move on. Um, so this is Prisos contents. Um, I'll leave it there for now. So the initial decision to publish the magazine um, was taken in 1959, uh, following the new phase in the political strategy of Kukwe, after destalinization and the 1956 events of Tashkent, in fighting, uh, peaceful coexistence, um, and importantly, a thus United Democratic Left 1958 election result in Greece which signaled the decision to ideologically prepare the ground for the return of the exiled Greek Communist Party. Pirsos' target readership was the young generation of the Greek political refugees in the socialist states, most of whom had never visited Greece. Some representatives of the generation, as I mentioned earlier, um, were amongst the contributors. Stathis Kouluriotis was one that um, lived in Dresden, studied in Dresden, came um, very young, and then ended up being one of his full-time members in Prisos in 1965. Um, but also the magazine was read across the refugee states, and it was also read by the economic migrants and students in the West. Uh, so this is a table, again, I will leave it very briefly, but I have the statistics if you want them. Uh, so from 1961 to 1966, and that's uh, the circulation in the socialist states. Uh, and this is the 1966, just to give you an idea that it was um, actually uh, distributed from Australia to Canada and Switzerland. So it's quite an interesting for, for that kind of publication. So following on from Prisot's condition of production, circulation and consumption, uh, I will proceed to discuss the magazine as a dialectical image, as I said at the beginning, uh, with its construction of Greek national imaginary. So Benjamin writes um, on his methodological figure of the dialectical image, and I quote, it is not that what is past that casts its light on what is present, or what is present its light on what is past. Rather than an image is that wherein has been comes together in a flash, with a now to form a constellation. In other words, image is dialectics at a standstill. 
So according to Benjamin, this coming together of the past and the present appear at the same time, in a flash, forming an image. So in Pirsos, they are juxtaposed to create the magazine. They manifest themselves in a flash through its layout. So I will begin the analysis uh, just briefly looking at the logo of the magazine, which is a logotype name written in a, a typeface which resembles Greek inscription. Um, the type is a logo, as the name, Pirsos, become an image sign. As such, they symbolize Greek identity and a continuity from antiquity to the present. As a visual identity, the purpose of a logo is and an image sign, as a claim, was to be recognized by its readership, who were invited to share a relation of resemblance and identity, um, and also identify themselves with this continuity. It's what Bennett Anderson famously said, to establish themselves in a national, as, as a national subject and an imagined community. That's another cover from 1963. So Brissot's preoccupation with antiquity extended to various articles and images. I'm just showing you um, as an example this one. Um, similarly, Epithoris Technis, which is in English, is Art Review, a cultural magazine published in Greece with the support of the United Democratic Left, EDA, had also employed cultural continuity with Greek antiquity and unity of Hellenism as principle of its editorial policy. The reason I'm referring to Epithoris Technis is because there are many reasons that connect the two publications. I don't have the time to go um, into it now, but it was happening also at the same time uh, in Greece. So according to researcher Alexandra Buffea, these principles were implemented in order to reinforce Epithoris Technis' ideological ammunition. So this suggests that the left in Greece, all or part of it, and similarly Prisos, um, were building a discourse in response and in opposition uh, to the Greek state. And I quote, and it's central uh, political myth based on the nation's continuity with the ancient past. A myth which, of course, as we know, excluded, and I quote again, the anti-Hellenic ambitions of the Greek Communist Party and its Slav allies. So looking at the photographs uh, of Pirsos, which uh, I've also looked at very closely and have been photoshopped for the time. So there, there is actually a lot of montages happening and these pictures I find extremely interesting. Um, one is transported to a traditional uh, folklore Greece. These images belong to the country's distant past as much as to this uh, 1960s reality. Um, as in Benjamin's dialectical image, these imagistic elements collide together, not in a linear progression, but emerge suddenly um, for the magazine's readers. Ellen McCracken, writing on the magazine, suggests that the front cover of magazines arouses in its readership the hope to find themselves on its glossy paper, um, on its front cover. So on the front cover, uh, we see two women, uh, the smiling, um, working knitting rugs or, or mending rugs, I'm not sure about that, uh, which is typ typically representative of uh, Greek folk art, like Kitechni. They're sitting under a balcony, uh, projected by the bright sunlight, which reflects on the white houses with the blue shutters and doors, suggesting that they are on a Greek Aegean island. To their left, uh, a clothesline uh, hangs heavy from the weight of rugs drying, indicating that the women must have been working for a while. Uh, blue and white have been extensively employed uh, to symbolize Greek sea and sun. Uh, they're in the Greek flag, uh, which also stands for the same uh, reference. And as archaeologist Elena Yaluri claims, they belong to the aesthetic uh, value of Greekness. Um, and she claims this harmony, light, and moderation uh, were portrayed as such since the creation of uh, the Greek nation state. However, the mythology of the specific uh, qualities of uh, the metaphysical power of the sun and the Aegean blue first appeared in the writings of the so-called uh, generation of the 30s. This literary movement, which also featured in the page, pages of Pirsos, 
promoted the myth of the cultural continuation of the Greek nation, its language, cost, customs, um, and artistic production of the common people. It asserted Greek cultural identity, mythologized, excuse me, mytho I should be saying, I should be able to say this Greek word, mythologizing nature and the Aegean uh, landscape as exclusively Greek, uh, connected to the essence of Hellenism. Um, and just briefly looking at the back um, cover of Pirsos, we're again confronted with predominantly blue and white colors. The photographs uh, depicts two men dressed in the distinctive costumes of Evzones, or Tsoliades in the vernacular. Uh, their position in the picture uh, suggests that they have been um, captured in the midst of dancing, uh, probably to a folk Greek song, Dimotiko. The figure of Tsolias was first depicted as the heroic Greek in lithographs by the Romantic Philhellenes during the Great uh, War, the Greek uh, War of Independence. And we were again reinvented for internal, internal consumption in the 40s by Greek artists. Since then, images of Tsoliades have been loaded as symbols of bravery and a form of socialist, uh, social excuse me, protest. As researcher uh, Anna F. Stastiadou asserts, uh, the materialization of resistance against tyranny. On the other hand, uh, Tsoliades is also a symbol associated with patriotism, national identity, and masculinity. Just briefly, and I'm, uh, I was hoping it would be bigger, is the image on the right-hand side that I'm just going to briefly um, discuss, and mainly not because of what it depicts, but uh, because of its caption, which says, Eliniki Levedia, so Greek Levedia, which I'm going to attempt to translate. Um, Levedia is very difficult to translate in English, so um, I will just, I'm sure most of you know the meaning of the word, uh, frequently used in literature, poetry, folklore, text, and songs, to refer to car courage or bravery, associated with heroes or freedom fighters. The political theorist Akis Gavrilidis claims that the aesthetics of Levedia as an attribute of Greek manliness was characteristic of the generation of the 30s and part of their anxious search, as he calls it, for original Greekness. That's also another page from uh, Pirsos. However, by the 1960s, uh, historian Kostas Katsapis claims that, claims, uh, that Levendia was used as a constituent principle in the discourse of the left. The so-called long 60s witnessed an explosive growth in cultural production in Greece, which resembled that of the 30s. This time, it was mainly leftist intellectuals who searched for the authentic, the popular, laico, and the traditional, as true art and culture, politismos, um, of high quality, with roots in the epic battle of Greek history. The folk songs, Dimotika, uh, belong to this discourse as they were identified with the heroic tradition of Hellenism. Hence, in the 60s in Greece, um, we see the witness of a reemergence of what historians Eric Hobsbawm and Terence Ranger call invented traditions. As in the case of antiquity, uh, which I examined um, earlier, this was also targeted against the Greek state, and I will do a lot of quotations at the moment, bourgeois discourse and the dependence on Western alliance and their imperialist ways of life. Of course, here is a really important uh, issue of expanding uh, national identity and discussing a specific case in the DDR, uh, national identity in relation to socialist achievements. But as I'm trying to already say too many things today, I'm going to leave this subject um, for possibly another paper. Um, so my reading so far has focused on these images uh, representative of Pirsos' visual language, of a Greek imaginary, past and present, which when collide together, collides together, can produce a barrage of associations. The spatial juxtaposition can construct an imaginary future. These ambiguous dialectical images, at a standstill, as Benjamin um, uh, has written, are utopic images. Utopic images, uh, at the which at the same time exhibit nostalgic attitudes towards romanticized national traditions, and that's a quote, are also fundamental principal characteristics of socialist realism. 
And again, I don't have much time to expand on the subject of socialist realism, but I will briefly mention um, that in the DDR, uh, we had a distinctly German version of socialist realism, uh, which had fundamentally, uh, in my opinion, influenced the production of Prisos. I think Prisos is a very interesting um, product outcome of, of socialist realism uh, in the DDR. Um, so, in the, in the DDR, on the one hand, we had, in, a, in accordance to the formalist debate of 1951, and Walter Ulbricht's favorite of what he called proletarian classicism, which was the rediscovery of Bittermeier arts and crafts as a historical inspiration in shaping a genuinely socialist Volkskultur that was, of course, nationalist, uh, national in form and socialist in content. On the other hand, uh, socialist real realism in the DDR drew from the struggles of the Weimar period. Um, that was an important reference point, and Weimar trained artists and designers, and of course authors uh, of all sorts, um, were still working. Um, so that wasn't kind of wiped out. A uh, professor in German, David Patrick, writes that the DDR, in the DDR, the Cold War rhetoric of the war on formalism and cosmopolitanism which was essentially, in terms of design and art, a war on Bauhaus um, that was distracting national consciousness, disappeared with its Stalinization. But what remained was the classical antagonism between the institution of affirmative culture on one hand and potential subversion at the hands of some form of modernism on the other. So I, I find this tension um, extremely interesting and also persuasive as a product of that tension. So in short, uh, the DDR's own path to modernity had never completely disappeared and it was still present um, by the 1960s. So in terms of design and publishing, also Leipzig and Dresden, as I'm sure all of you know, were, uh, and in Dresden where was, uh, Prisos was published, had returned to the president of the early 20th century, promoting the production through international fairs and exhibition, um, and exchanging uh, opinions, seeing what's happening um, in the international scene there. And also having a really important production from books and magazines. So Prisos's form in relation to its content adhere to this context of um, aesthetic production. Just again, um, briefly to say that I've discussed the national, but then what I really want to point out in relation to what I've just been discussing um, is that Pirsos, even this cover, which is I think is one of the most um, less dynamic of, of, of the collection, um, of the corpus, um, one can see dynamic typography. There's a visible grid, there is white space, uh, there are shapes that are in bright colors, which are all um, ex uh, expressions of international style in typography and design. Um, so I would really like to briefly move to the editorial policy and then kind of conclude. Um, Pirsos's editorial policy, according to its statement in 1961 on the first issue, um, the reasons we are not being published, I suppose, um, is based on three strands. Uh, so material would come from Greece, that was the first one. So it's history, morals and customs, folklore treasures and democratic traditions, contemporary intellectual and creative life, and the beauty of the land, the land being topos. Secondly, the, life, uh, and achievement, the lives and achievements of the Greek political refugees in the socialist states, also facilitating their exchange um, and experiences across the refugee land. Um, and finally, socialism, the successes of the people who are building socialism, who struggle for socialism, and for those uh, who are struggling for the freedom and independence, example, the African independence in the 1960s. Just to, again, give you a closer look of some of the images, that's a cover from 64, the third issue of 1964. And that's Bruno on the left-hand side. That's a spread, these two pages from the first issue, and there's an, is um, an article on, on education in Greece and the state of, 
the struggles of youth, rather, on the left-hand side, on the right, there are Greek political refugees that are um, producing a film in Moscow, in Moscow Films, in Soviet Union. An article on African independence. The readers of Pissos and the political refugees that honor Greece. An article dedicated to those that um, graduated from the fine arts, Greek, Greek political refugees. Do you want to return to Greece? Is the article, and it's a survey from um, youth, a lot of them from the DDR. And two worlds, um, you can guess which worlds are this. So I believe that Pirsos's readers were invited to compare and contrast the material in the magazine and to position themselves in its pages. Amongst the heroic past of the Greek people, the nation's traditions, and surrounded by the beauty of the landscape. Also amongst the Greek people's struggle for democracy, in the reflection of their own lives, as part of the achievements of socialism, which granted them opportunities for education and work. The reality of the future, to quote Benjamin again, is rendered visible through the participation in the construction of meaning. As if looking through a stereoscope, Pirsos's readers participated in the creation of a third dimensional image, constructed by two images seen together at the same time. The country's past, in synchronic existence with contemporaneous reality. This was the intended new narrative that was synthesized out of these two images, um, the imaginary construction of a future, the project of repatriation. Thank you for your patience with my name.